Welcome to another episode of the Watchdog Podcast here on Mint Press with me, Low Key. As you know, weekly we are going against the grain, really focusing and honing in on the stories which are routinely ignored by the mainstream media. For that reason, we hope that you can support us by liking, sharing, subscribing to this channel and also joining us on Patreon. We need all the support we can get as an independent media outlet in increasingly tough times. Now, this week we are speaking about the news that is on everybody's lips. What is happening in Ukraine? Now, we could start this story in 1812 when Napoleon crossed over into Russia. We could start this story in 1917 when the British, along with the Americans and the Japanese and the French, invaded Russia to do what Winston Churchill described as strangle the revolution in its cradle. But for the sake of time, we're going to start in 2008. You can access this document on NATO's website. The Bucharest Summit, one of the conclusions of it and the joint statement of those attending it, read as follows. NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agree today that these countries will become members of NATO. Now, at the time, the Russian government made absolutely clear that Ukraine becoming part of NATO was an existential threat. When you think about it this way, and you look at countries like Poland and Romania, already having NATO missile systems pointed at Russia from them. When you take into account that if missiles are placed in Ukraine, they will be 500 kilometers from Moscow. When you understand that NATO is a relic, this is an organization that in the early 90s promised it would not extend beyond Germany. And what did it do? It extended 14 member states closer to Russia. When you understand it as an organization which is aiming to essentially balkanize Russia in the long term, then it makes perfect sense what is happening today. Of course, Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, wrote in his book, The Grand Chessboard, that without Ukraine, Russia goes from a Eurasian power to simply Asian. And we have seen this recent depiction on the front cover of newspapers and magazines of Vladimir Putin as essentially Asian. We've also seen the EU and Ukraine step up their relationship. Also, we know that the closing of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is a major victory for the United States and the LNG producers, who now have the chance to take over the market of gas in Europe, especially in the situation that we are in today. What the closing of the Nord Stream 2 also represents is an, is an opportunity for the United States to pass off the danger of a Russian, Chinese and German alliance. And so by doing this, the United States is effectively separating Russia off from Europe. We also know that the State Department's head of Russia policy, Victoria Nuland, has been recorded several years ago discussing candidates within the Ukrainian government and essentially selecting who would be most pleasing to Washington. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yacht. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleet and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I just think Kleech going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. 
When I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki Moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it. And, you know, fuck the EU. This is essentially a NATO war. Make no mistake about it. We've seen it lamented online that this war is afflicting, un, um, unlike previous wars, civilized people who look just like us. When you look at what happened in the last refugee crisis in Europe back in 2015, Poland was one of the EU countries that, you know, was hesitant to take in refugees. Talk about what has changed. Just to put it bluntly, these are not refugees from Syria. These are refugees from uh, neighboring Ukraine. I mean, that, quite frankly, is part of it. These are um, Christians. They're white. They're... Um... This isn't a place, with all due respect, um, you know, like Iraq or Afghanistan. This is a relatively civilized, uh, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully too, a city where you wouldn't expect that or hope that it's going to happen. It's really emotional for me because I see European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed. These are not people trying to get away from areas in North Africa. They look like any European family that you would live next door to. And this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. We've seen very popular British broadcasters lamenting the use of vacuum bombs. Rumours of a thermobaric bomb, which is sort of vacuum bomb, which to be fair, the US has used before in Afghanistan, but the idea of it being used in Europe is, is, is stomach churning. It's important to remember that the world's number one producers of producer of thermobaric missiles, aka the vacuum bombs, which suck the air out of the people they target, is the US arms company Lockheed Martin, the biggest in the world. And their AGM-114 Hellfire has been used over the previous decades in Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, and Afghanistan, during which the value of Lockheed Martin shares increased by 1,235%. We are also seeing the walls closing in in Britain and the United States on Roman Abramovich. Now, he is in a very difficult and tense position. We also know that Danny uh, Dayan, the former head of the umbrella organization of the illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank, of all of them put together, the Yesha Council, is lobbying the US not to sanction Roman Abramovich. Now, the way that it is being presented is that this appeal comes from Yad Vashim, Yad Vashim being Israel's Holocaust Center Memorial. Now, this organization not only is a third funded by the Israeli state, its chair, Danny Dayan, in this case, was selected by the Israeli government. Essentially, this is an arm of the Israeli government lobbying the US government not to sanction Abramovich. It's well known that he pumped over $100 million from the British Virgin Islands into Er David an organization which is cleansing Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah of Palestinians as we speak. Now, UK Foreign Minister Joyce Annale described this organization, Air David, as carrying out radical settler activities under the guise of tourism. However, this organization has a UK branch by the name of UK Friends of the City of David. Now, the question has to be asked, why is this organization based here, one of its directors being the IDF spokesman, uh, Doran Spielman, considered a charity by the UK Charity Commission. Also, in other news, we have seen BBC correspondent Jeremy Bowman and former main presenter on BBC's flagship political show, Newsnight, Emily Matlis, come out with very, very clear political statements encouraging different things within Ukraine. Now, Jeremy Bowen has put online this guide of how to use Molotovs to target Russian tanks. Now, it's important for us to point out the incestuous revolving door relationship that exists between the BBC, the mainstream media that we have in this country, and not only the Ministry of Defense, but specifically NATO. 
for instance, Mark Leighty, who was the BBC's defence correspondent for many years, less than a month after he quit his job, went on to be NATO's spokesman. In fact, today you have a BBC broadcaster and presenter by the name Victoria Cook, who simultaneously worked for NATO. In addition to that, Ronnie Jay, a uh, worker at the BBC Five Live um, and later went on to be the British Army press officer while he was working for BBC Five Live, also worked for NATO. And then not long after that, between working for NATO and the British uh, Army, he was a worker at LBC. You also have Bojan Lazic, who was a psychological operations specialist at NATO at the same time as working for the BBC. Also, Matt Warsdell was an employee at NATO implementation lead for their communications and information agency at the same time as being a project manager for the BBC. Another gentleman by the name of Soleiman Redmanish was a PSYOP specialist at NATO at the same time as working for the BBC World Service. You also had David McGee working as a news producer for the BBC and less than a month after finishing his work for the BBC, going on to work for NATO. Dominic Valaitis, again, a BBC employee and NATO at the same time. And in a similar way to the previous trajectory of Mark Leite, we see Una Legesco going from being a BBC presenter to working as a spokesperson for NATO. But perhaps in this whole um, structure of our mainstream media, one of the most glaring conflicts of interest that I have found is of the former foreign news editor at Sky News, Lorna Ward. At the very same time she was the foreign news editor at Sky News, she was a strategic communications advisor to the deputy commander of NATO in Afghanistan. Lieutenant General Adrian Bradshaw. She claims to have advised Bradshaw on all media and communications issues and planned all media engagements while also working as foreign news editor for Sky News. Today, she runs her own private uh, company, which she claims also has contracts with the Israeli government. Another example of this a uh, glaring conflict of interest is Polly Middlehurst, a presenter on the much maligned and mobilized against GB News, a former presenter on Sky News also. But simultaneous to being a presenter on GB News, she is a strategic communications employee of NATO and a media coach at the Ministry of Defense. These are the kind of conflicts of interest which exist today in our media sphere. And our job, as Asa does so well, our guest who's coming up now, um, cutting through these relationships, cutting through the crap and getting straight to the story. So today is my pleasure to be joined by one of my favorite journalists. He has broken so many important stories, especially regarding Palestine and the activities of the Israel lobby in this country. We're joined today on The Watchdog by Asa Winstanley. Asa, how are you? Oh, it's great to be with you, Loki. Um, I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm really good. Now, uh, we know that a lot of attention has recently been poured. In a way, the mainstream media has weaponized the uh, Jewish heritage of Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, to try and stave off these uh, genuine... Um, inquiries into the nature of the groups fighting in Ukraine, like the Azov Battalion, C-14, and others. Now, you at Electronic Intifada, as early as 2018, were pointing out um, some of these aspects of the Azov Battalion. So first, can you just break down for us, how could Ukraine have a problem with Nazis if the President Zelensky is Jewish? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and I think you're right that uh, Zelensky's uh, Jewish background has been uh, a very useful sort of um, 
tool in the information war. I mean, we've seen it quite a lot this week. Every time I tweet something about the Azov Battalion, um, I get all these mysterious Twitter followers with no, all these mysterious Twitter accounts that have just popped up most of them in the last month or two. Mike um, Brown, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, nine. Exactly. And, you know, they've got one follower or something like that. And they say things like, well, they vary between, oh, the Azov Battalion has got no influence. Oh, I heard the Azov Battalion disbanded. Uh, and and then, you know, and there's no, no basis for any of this. It's not true. Um, it very much had not disbanded and it is active on the ground in the fighting uh in ukraine at the moment particularly in, in mariupol where it's really is where its headquarters is near the donbass region uh, actually in the donbass region but near the uh the the, the sector of the donbass region which the uh, pro-russian separatists uh controlled up until this most recent uh russian invasion um and you know so you get all these bots and they say things like that you know uh, but then they doubt they sort of very between downplaying them and then others more disturbingly say things actually you know they they're ukrainian patriots and they're they're just defending it's important to note that these groups are nazi groups right so you know there's there's so much um being said in the mainstream media right now where we're, we're reaching a really dangerous moment where this kind of mccarthyism is being whipped up you know this week we saw um, RT, Russia Today, um, removed from British Airwaves, um, incidentally, due to a decision by the European Union and not the British government. Um, so, so much for Brexit. Um, and even YouTube blocked it in Britain, you know, again, an uh, indirect decision of the European Union. Um, and we're, a lot of the mainstream media propaganda is kind of counter propaganda because they're saying well there's no basis to what vladimir putin is saying about ukrainian nazis um unfortunately regardless of what we think of vladimir putin um and his politics and not my politics and um you know obviously war is a very bad thing and nobody wants to see a war in ukraine um but as it happens, when he talks about Ukrainian Nazis, he happens to be right. Like, OK, so people say things like one of the objections when you point out to these various Nazi groups in Ukraine is, oh, well, it's not. It's an exaggeration. You know, it, it can't be all the people in Ukraine. And that's right. Like, it's it's not all the people in Ukraine. But then when is it like not? It never is like the majority of the people in any country are never going to be Nazis. Like that's, that's the definition of Nazism. It's an armed gang of fascists that take over by force, whether, you know, in a immediate coup or slowly, you know, Hitler didn't come out of nowhere in 1933, let alone in 1939. You know, he was slow. He, he you know, he, he tried to have the beer hall putsch and all this stuff and he was building up his forces. Um, and, you know, eventually he did get some electoral success, um, but he never had this, you know, he never had a, uh, he never had a complete um, an ambiguous majority. You know, there was always, you know, at least 50 percent of the population that was voting for either the Social Democrats or the communists. Unfortunately, they were divided between themselves, which which helped. But the point is the Nazis in Ukraine have important levers of power so for example the azov battalion which i wrote about in 2018 um this explicitly nazi group it's part of the armed forces you know like I, again one of the um objections you hear when you point out to these ukrainian nazi groups online and and this is from people just normal people as well just could just be liberals or whoever or people who maybe are not that much informed they'll say things like Oh, well, you know, every country's got Nazis and, um, you know, you're not objecting to them. And, uh, you know, it's it's not most people. Yeah, there is there is. Um, so, of course, you know, we have uh, the EDL. They're not explicitly Nazi, but they're certainly a fascist organization. BMP, um, 
in decline, really. We had that. We used to have the National Front. Um, and in America, of course, you've got the KKK and various neo-Nazi organizations. Um, but, you know, like if, if I don't know, I'm trying to think of a parallel to the Azov Battalion. That I, I suppose there's this group, um, this band group, National Action, this ex extreme British Nazi organization, which was outlawed as a terrorist group. The, the Azov, what's happened with the Azov Battalion in Ukraine would be the equivalent of national action being made a unit of the armed forces of Britain, like officially not. And this is not infiltration. It's not like, oh, it's a few bad apples that have infiltrated. You know, it's not like, oh, OK, there's some police that have got Nazi tattoos. That's a bad thing. Yeah, this is a whole levels beyond that. In 2014, 2014, this organization was established and integrated into the Ukrainian armed forces. I think one aspect also of this equation, which hasn't received enough attention, is the presence of Igor Kolomoisky as a major, in fact, the top funder of Zelensky, but simultaneous right. to that being a top funder of the Azov Battalion and also the, um, the Idar Battalion, who Zelensky has recently put in charge um, uh, the, the, the uh, former commander of the Idar Battalion um, as the regional administration, administrator of Odessa. Now, the Pandora Papers revealed these payments that were coming from Kolomoisky to Zelensky from these offshore accounts. And of course, the Pandora Papers were widely um, vaunted across the English language media, but very little attention has been given to that particular relationship. And also, as you said, no, Azov are not the majority, of course, but they are essential in the frontline activity. And in Maripol, they've also been seen attacking an international Women's Day march of feminists and liberals also. So it's very important. It's a very important, important part of the story, which is not being engaged with. I mean, also, Asa, um, in the past, we've had uh, conversations about NATO's ability to subsume uh, Nazis across the last 50, 60, 70 years. Can you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, so I mean, I think that this is really important that we, especially in Britain, but in the West in general, we do not know what NATO is, like in terms of us as the population and us as the left. We don't know what it is. We really need to educate ourselves about this. You know, it's we, we saw, unfortunately, I saw D Diane Abbott the other day describing it as a defensive, alli defensive alliance. It's not a defensive alliance. It's never been a defensive alliance. It's always been an aggressive um, organization targeted at Russia. You know, um, if you look at the history of NATO, when it was first established, the Russians, the USSR, as it was at the time, they knew what this was about. It was about creating an anti-Russian military alliance at the beginning of the Cold War. So the Russians said, OK, but ostensibly they were saying, oh, this is a defensive alliance. That's what that's the lie that has been all along. So the Russians kind of played that game and they said, OK, it's a defensive alliance. So we'll join. We'll apply to join. And they applied to join. And of course, they were rejected. Um, so, you know, it's 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 a smokescreen. If you look at you no, know, if you look at the expansion of NATO, since the end of the Soviet Union, when the Americans infamously promised Gorbachev not one inch further east, we will expand. The exact opposite of that has happened. All that's happened is NATO has expanded uh, more, more and more towards the borders of Russia. And we have to think, you know, as opposed we are, uh, as we all are to war, um, what do you think the United States would accept what the Russians have been uh, what the Russians have been asked to accept or demanded to accept, which was as, as essentially the prospect of American nuclear weapons on their border. Do you think if the left wing president of Mexico, as there is now, started to turn more towards Russia 
and decided, hang on a minute, I'm going to host Russian nuclear weapons in Mexico on the American border. Do you think the Americans would accept that? Of course not. They would, in fact, they would do far more than Putin has done in this um, limited invasion and intervention in Russia. Uh, the Americans would annihilate Mexico. I mean, you, they'd do what they did to Iraq. They'd just bomb indiscriminately, destroy, they'd kill a million people. They'd just invade and have a regime change. So, you know, we can't really compare the two in that way. So I think it, it's important to have this context of NATO. And what is NATO? NATO, the so-called North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I just saw a headline this morning, Mike Pompeo, former CIA director, former State Department, is now saying, oh, well, we should recognize Taiwan. You know, and then the next step will be, of course, uh, uh, to be uh, getting uh, Taiwan to join NATO, so, <laughs> which is ludicrous, you know, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. You know, it's thousands of miles from the North Atlantic. So this is the pretext. So the history of, of NATO it's important that people understand the history of NATO is that it is a, a Nazi organization. I mean, that's not an exaggeration. Um, it, after what has been happening in Ukraine is not unique. Like after, after, the, after the Second World War, the Russians, the USSR, um, Stalin, they started to denazify the countries in Eastern Europe, up to East Germany, they they denazified and they, you know, they executed Nazis, they removed Nazis from public life. Um, but the, in the West, in Western Europe, with the American occupation uh, in Western Europe, which continues to this day, you know, there's still 10, I don't know how many tens of thousands of American troops in Germany, all over Europe, in, in Britain, you know, Britain, uh, America has uh, nuclear weapons in Britain. Um, the Nazis, the, four, the the high level Nazis, and we're not talking about neo-Nazis here. There's no there's no neo about it. They were Nazis. They were Hitler's Nazis, leading SS officers, perpetrators of the Holocaust. Um, some of the worst war criminals were rehabilitated and they were taken and given top level um, scientific positions um, they would they were they were used all over the world in 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 by the American Empire um, in all sorts of positions. So you can take one example of um, uh, an SS officer called uh, Reinhard Gellin. He was responsible for some of the worst crimes in in Eastern Europe. Uh, he was a um, intelligence officer. He was a Nazi intelligence officer. He headed the Nazi intelligence against the um, USSR during Operation Barbarossa, the, inv the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Um, and towards the end of the war, when it was clear the Nazis was, were losing, he switched sides. He went over to the Americans. He was then his um, networks were then deployed um, all over the world to help the um, American Empire during the Cold War. And this is this is a big this is a big part unspoken part of our history you know we always like when we which is not taught in schools like in our schools we're, we're always taught about um the british war effort during world war ii and all this kind of stuff and how you know the 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 blitz and all these kind of things those things are true too but there's this other side to it which is that yes we were on the right side in terms of uh, being against the nazis in in World War II, but there was kind of, in a way, at the end, there was a victory of Nazism because some of the leading Nazis were then able to continue their work. And what happened was a lot of leading positions after the end of the Second World War were, were, were former Nazis. But in addition to that, and this is quite open, like the West German government as well, the West German government's intelligence services were, were led by top Nazis, including the, the Reinhard Gellin, who I mentioned earlier. So, uh, but in addition to that, what NATO established, what um, CIA and its predecessor organization, the OSS and MI6 established, which was then later led and coordinated by NATO, was 
a, sec a series of secret armies across Western Europe, which were overwhelmingly populated by Nazis, um, neo-fascists, um, some conservative elements, and even some minority social democrats. Uh, but by by and large, it was mostly Nazis. It was mostly Francoists. You know, it was it was the most brutal um, uh, armed forces within the uh, mostly military intelligence of different countries in Western Europe um, to set up secret NATO uh, Nazi armies coordinated by NATO all around Europe from, you know, all around the, 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 the NATO countries, the anti-Soviet Union countries, which stretched from France to in the West and Britain in Britain and France in the West, all the way over to Turkey in the East. And what these groups did was um, carried out because they were um, just absolutely riddled by Nazis, um, including in West Germany. They carried out um, atrocities, and these were these were false flag. Quite often, they were false flags. You know, you hear a lot about um, the sort of kooky conspiracy theorists like um, Alex Jones like to talk a lot about false flags. But there is false flags in history. They have happened. And we, you know, we saw this last uh, month or two, there was a lot of talk in the mainstream media about Putin supposedly planning a false flag as a pretext uh, for his, his invasion of Russia. That never happened. But false flags have happened in history. So, for example, in the context of this um, NATO secret Nazi army, we saw the Bologna bomb bombing. In 1982 in Italy, where I believe it was around 80 people, 80 civilians were, were just, just murdered in this bombing. And it was then made out that this bombing was carried out by so-called hard left groups in Italy as a way to discredit the Communist Party of Italy, which, you know, in contrast to communist parties, uh, the communist parties in, in Britain, for example, was incredibly popular. You know, it came very close um, to uh, winning the first elections after World War II. And it was only due to CIA intervention and meddling in that um, election that it didn't win. But, you know, the, the Communist Party still remained strong after that. It was a major opposition party. And these kind of um, sabotage operations had to be carried out. So the, these kind of false flag operations, so it was made out to be uh, a work, the work of the left, like a left wing splinter group. In fact, it was the work of um, what was titled Gladio, Operation Gladio, um, which was the Italian branch of this, this network of secret NATO armies, which were riddled, absolutely riddled by Nazis and fascists of all kinds. Um, and, you know, we could call the, the network as a whole has, has come to be known as Gladio because it was the Italian, the Italian part of this network, which was first exposed in the early 90s. And this all came out, it was quite a big story at the time, especially in the European press. Um, there was a there was a Italian Senate investigation, you know, it was a big scandal, but we've not really learned the lessons from it. And Gladio, um, you know, I'm sure um, fake leftists, like especially Paul Mason, would like to say if they ever acknowledged it, were forced to acknowledge it, would say it's a thing of the past. But I think what we're seeing in Ukraine now represents a kind of victory of Operation Gladio, because, of course, Ukraine in the days of Gladio was part of the Soviet Union. And there was no question of these so-called stay behinds um, being... <laughs> In the Soviet Union, there would there would instead be sabotage operations against Soviet countries. Um, so you know this. What I'm trying to say, uh, in a nutshell, is that the fact of these Nazis in Ukraine today holding such a huge influence of power, and maybe we can get into more detail about of, about how they do that. Um, there's a long history to it. it; doesn't come out of nowhere. Absolutely, man. And it has been uh, said that if we were to try and list every single Nazi that collaborated with the CIA, it would take almost 3000 pages. One of the most 
clear examples is the team that Sidney Gottlieb, um, the US scientist who worked for the CIA developing MK Ultra, the team that he assembled around him of doctors and scientists, a huge portion of them were people that had worked directly for the Nazi party. Now, one side of this, which I just want to mention, is also that when cutting Russia off from the global economic system in the ways that the US and many different companies have, you've now seen a block develop whereby China, Russia and India have agreed to trade not in dollars. Now that in and of itself um, is an economy of over two and a half, around two and a half billion people. In the long term, this will further isolate the United States. But obviously in the short term, there will be considerable damage from this, considerable damage from this. I think it's also worth mentioning that across the first four to five days of war, you saw the price of shares in the French arms company Thales increase by over 26% in five days alone. It's important for us to note at this point that Thales, who will no doubt be arming all of the neighbor states to Russia, we know that um, Ben Wallace, the defense minister here, has called for a boost of over 25 billion of the British arms budget, that Thales have recruited basically a bunch of former British politicians to help them in their mission. One of them is James Abuthnot, a former conservative MP who has been on the board of Thales for quite some time. You also have General Timothy Granville Chapman on the advisory board of Thales. He was previously uh, the vice chief of defense. Um, also, you have Lord Charles Powell, who is, um, sits in the House of Lords. He's on the advisory board for Thales since 2015. Very interestingly, you also have former Labour Defence Minister Ann Taylor, who dealt with quite a lot of Thales contracts, has been a consultant advisor at Thales since 2010. And she was actually chief whip um, during Tony Blair's time from 1998 to 2001. So these are the people that really benefit from wars. Of course, the price of shares in BAE systems has risen. Well, it rose over 21% in the first five days of war. We know that Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, the producers of the Javelin um, uh, military hardware, which has been so useful to the Ukrainians, the price of their shares have also increased exponentially essentially. But also, Asa, it's important to ask you at this point, in 2018, you published an article for Electronic Intifada questioning whether Israel was actually arming the Azov battalion. Is that the case? Yeah, um, it wasn't questioning it. It was saying that they are outright. <laughs> because they are. like. Um, so this is in the context of this... Um, this history that we were just talking about and you know it's difficult to it's such a it's such a wide history like if people want to read more about this the best book is is nato secret armies by a i believe he's a swiss academic called daniele ganser it's an excellent book like it, it's it's kind of um it's a bit hard to get but um you know it's a bit expensive it's about 20 25 pounds something like that but um you know, you can get it online as well. And um, it's, I mean, I read it recently. It's stunning. Like it's, it's unbelievable. Like the, he goes through all the countries that um, Gladio, the Gladio network was operational in and everything we know about it. And it is so hard to get your head around because it's like, you know, we have this image, especially in Britain of where the good guys, we were on the right side, but actually you read this book and it's like, well, we're kind of the bad guys if, if you know by we you mean depends what you mean by we obviously but in terms of the British state 
MI6 was training. MI6 and CIA were at the top of all this because they were training. They were giving the training to like these 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 gladio Italian fascists were trained in SAS bases in Britain, and they then used those skills to kill Italian civilians. Um, you know, and this happened all over. The, these kind of things happened all over Belgium, France, uh, Germany, West Germany. You know, um, in Portugal. Um, at, uh, Spain was, of course, um, ruled by Franco up until the late 70s, the Italian fascist dictator. And Spain was a base, a major base for all these um, fascist gladio groups carrying out these um, false flag operations against um, the civilian population of Western Europe. Um, Portugal, it, B Portugal before the revolution um, was... Um, a major uh, Portuguese um, Portuguese fascists who were really embedded in the Portuguese armed forces and carrying out atrocities in in Portugal's overseas colonies um, before the the decolonization of the Portuguese Empire. Um, you know, they they all all these people went on to carry out crimes in the in the Gladio network. Um, but so the the arming of um, the Azov Battalion and the other far right organizations in Ukraine who have these important levers of power in the, the current Ukrainian government, even despite the fact that this president is of Jewish heritage, um, are being armed by, by the United States. They're being armed by Canada, especially. There's a big um, Canadian pro-Ukrainian Nazi lobby in, in Canada. Um, the US, Canada, the European Union and the UK are all arming and training these Nazi organizations in Ukraine precisely because they are integrated, they're, they're in the armed forces. So they just say, of course, they're not saying, oh yeah, we're, we're arming Ukrainian Nazis, but the, 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 that's what they're doing in effect because they are part of the armed forces they're close to the police now as well. You mentioned earlier the Ukrainian oligarch Igor Kolomoisky, and and he um, was one of the main funders, I think the main funder of the Azov Battalion. Um, and, at, and at the same time, later on, when we saw um, uh, Vladimir Zelensky's presidential campaign, he funded that as well. So it's like capitalism does not mind siding with fascists if they believe that is what is going to promote their interest they'll do whatever it takes um so what we've got is so in that context it's although it's astonishing to think that israel which calls itself the jewish state is arming a fascist organization an explicitly nazi organization which is actually in in a lot of ways um, still very anti-Semitic because that is at the roots of its ideology, even though it's kind of disseminating, dissimulating that at the moment. Um, that is not far under the surface. Um, so in that context of the all these NATO and pro-NATO countries arming the Ukrainian armed forces, arming Ukrainian fascists, it shouldn't be a surprise that Israel is arming them because they're doing the same thing that their the Western imperial allies are doing. Um, uh, so, you know, we, what I showed in that article from 2018 is that, um, it, you know, the story was, was quite big and people were like, oh, this is amazing investigative journalism. And it was quite hard work, but like the basics of it are not that hard to find. All I had to do was look on the Azov Battalion's website and their, um, their YouTube channels and their online presence. And it's all there, like they're openly waving these Nazi flags, this sw basically a swastika symbol, the, the Wolf's Angle, which looks quite similar to a swastika, but it's it's another symbol that was used by SF, SS tank divisions during World War II. So it's an explicitly Nazi symbol. They also use the Black Sun, which is a neo-Nazi symbol used all over Europe. Um, they're a Nazi organization. Um, their founder, um, their founder, me, that that, excuse me, their founder, then their first military commander, who later attempted to become a politician and had some limited success, but it was um, beaten back in the last elections. 
Andrew Belitsky, you know, he's a, he's a young guy, right? This is not, you know, a Nick Griffin kind of has-been figure. He's a young military commander. And according to the Telegraph in 2014, he once wrote that, quote, the historic mission of our nation in this critical moment is to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade for their survival, a crusade against the Semite-led Untermenschen. You know, and this is a Ukrainian writing. So, I mean... <sighs> I, I guess this quote has gone through several different levels of um, translation. So I suppose you'd have to check the original Ukrainian to see if he used the word Untermen German word Untermenschen, which is explicitly Nazi. But in any case, in talking about Semite led Untermenschen, that is an explicitly anti Semitic statement, you know. Um, and we, what this leads to wider ideas that we're seeing now where. Um, Putin is being presented as this Easterner. We saw in this Wall Street Journal graphic where he's dressed up as Genghis Khan, as if he's this invader from the uncivilized uh, East. And, and this is the idea that is being presented by these Nazi organizations in Ukraine, and which is why now what we're seeing happen is we're seeing um, far right groups, far, you know, extreme Nazis from all over Europe are going to be now flocking to Ukraine to fight in Ukraine because there's weapons being given out willy-nilly by the Ukrainian government to anyone who wants them. Um, you know, heavy weaponry is being pumped in. You know, when we're talking about this Nazi group, the Azov Battalion, you know, you shouldn't picture the BMP, you shouldn't picture the KKK, um, you shouldn't picture the Proud Boys in America. Yes, they have similar ideologies, absolutely. But these are armies. This is an army, right? The, the the Azov Battalion. It's more like the special forces. Look at their so you know. Don't have to take my word for it. Look at their social media. Look at their website. They have tanks. You know, they're very well organized. This is a modern army which is being armed and trained by NATO and by Israel to a lesser extent. So yes, Israel is doing that, and it's doing that. Uh, the the specific way that I uncovered in my article, they're doing it is by funneling in these uh, rifles, Tavor rifles. So the um, Israel Military Industries, this Israeli weapons company, um, has licensed um, the production of Tavor rifles in Ukraine. And these are then being given by the Ukrainian armed forces to the, neo -na the, the Nazi, nothing really neo about it because there was a continuity of history there between um, Ukrainian fascists who collaborated with Hitler and participated in the Holocaust um, to these Ukrainian Nazi groups. And you see, I mean, uh, you know, I, I preserved the photos in my article, um, but, you know, I haven't gone back and checked recently. I'm sure they're still there. You see these Ukrainian Nazis holding table rifles and it's quite, it's, it's quite a recognizable Israeli rifle, which is used by Israeli special forces, you know? So, um, and, and it's all there on their websites. And the, I even found this one video of this Azov Nazi on his on YouTube doing like a review. Oh, this is the table rifle. You know, it's produced by this Ukrainian company um, and it does this and that. And um, yeah, it was all there. Um, and yeah, this is what's happening. And according to um, the Israeli lawyer that I um, who alerted me about this in the first place, Ite Mac. Um, you know, there there is reports as well of Israelis going in and doing training a, a, a long time, years ago now, training these people. Um, and so this is part as well of, of a longer, as well as this context of NATO and the whole pro-Nazi um, impetus of NATO. It's part of a long, another hidden history of Israel arming some of the worst right-wing extremists around the world if they think that it will serve U the US empire, which they did. Um, all over the world in Honduras, for example, um, in Iran, before the uh, rise of the Isla uh, Islamic Republic, um, when it was the Shah, they were big allies with, um, the, Israel was big allies with the Shah. Um, the Contras in Nicaragua, you know, there was a period when Reagan was blocked because, you know, the Contras human rights abuses against um, Nicaraguan civilians in order to in order to try and overthrow the um, victorious and popular left wing government, they waged a brutal war. You know, a, br a disgusting war 
and all these war crimes were being committed by the CIA army, the Contras in Nicaragua. Um, and it became so blatant that there was a period when, this is in the 80s, when Congress actually blocked Reagan and the CIA from sending weapons and training and support to, to the Contras, the counter-revolutionaries. And at that time, a way to get around that was funneling the weapons through Israel. And that's, you know, Israel played that role. Israel is a useful imperial tool to, you, to the United States empire. And it, it, um, it has been for many years. And so this is really the context of this. It's also important to note that the um, Tavor rifle that comes from IWI, which is formerly a division of IMI, is owned by Elbit Systems. So we have Israel's largest arms manufacturer, which is the subject of a massive campaign in Britain, an unprecedented campaign. We've defeated them in Oldham. This organization is linked to arms being funneled into Ukraine, essentially to pour that country into at least a decade of chaos. We're talking about when you're giving 10,000 rifles out in the capital city, you are turning that population as a legal uh, designation from civilians to quote unquote enemy combatants. So you're encouraging, yeah. it's, it's like Hillary Clinton yeah. said in that recent interview, this is the Afghanistan model. You draw Russia into the quagmire, which drains it down, you don't really care about this population that, you, you know, you are constantly pushing forward this idea that you're doing this and you're and you're astroturfing the idea that people need to demand boots on the ground. Yeah, you the say, American empire is willing to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood. Exactly, exactly. And and what this is going to mean for people there is disastrous in yeah. many ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is absolutely the American empire using uh, the Afghanistan model, but I also think they're doing the Syria model. So like you said, like this um, action by the Ukrainian president of making, of opening up the armories and giving these weapons to anyone who wants them, it's really what, in many ways, is what we saw in Syria. And we see billions really going in from the CIA, from private from CIA contractors, CIA mercenaries to funnel to Ukrainians. And what we're seeing is they're, of course, claiming that they're going to be funding essentially moderate rebels, right, against the Russian um, intervention, against the Russian occupation as they see it. They, they're going to be uh, <laughs> arming what they will claim are moderate rebels in exactly the same way as they did in Syria. But what will happen is in exactly the same way as in Syria, the weapons are going to the worst, most um, regressive forces in the region. In the case of Syria, it was Al Qaeda and ISIS. Essentially, that's what happened. All, you know, all these kind of moderate rebels melted away, but Al Qaeda and ISIS was really what uh, were being armed in the end of the day. The same way here, the people with the most power who are going to be getting all these weapons are the Azov sector, the the Azov battalion, the right sector and the other Nazi groups in Ukraine, because they are going to be the most determined fighters against the Russians because they're the most anti-Russian forces. So that's what's going to be happening. And it is a rest, you know, we can only hope for de-escalation, for return to negotiations, and for, um, you know, a, a, a military wind down and for, you know, a, a negotiated settlement. But I, I'm afraid that, you know, I fear the same thing happening that you do, which is, uh, you know, a decade of chaos in Ukraine, funded by NATO weapons. I think it's also important that I um, clarify one of those um, things that I just said. So the Tavor is produced by IWI, um, which is owned by the SK Group. Now, formerly, it, it was a division of IMI, which is owned by Elbit, but it was sold to the SK Group in 2005. Um, so it's important that we just have that um, clear. So, Asa, 
Um, where can people keep in touch with your important work? There's so much more to talk about and we'll have to have you back on another occasion to talk about the way in which we now find ourselves with the majority of the left in this country, essentially to the right of Henry Kissinger on foreign mm. policy, especially regarding Ukraine. It was Henry Kissinger that argued in the Washington Post um, in 2014 that it would not be a good idea for Ukraine to join NATO. And rather than serving as a bulwark of the West against the East, it should serve as a bridge. Um, and as I say, we find ourselves essentially in the minority of those who even mention the word NATO in relation to what is happening there today. So Asa, how can we keep in touch with you and how can we keep on top of your great work? Um, I've got a Substack, uh, asawinstanley.substack.com. You know, I do weekly free um, newsletter, which people can read. And um, I put out my kind of thoughts for the week, recommended reading for the week, including my own articles and media appearances. So that's the easiest way for people to stay on top of all my work. Um, I'm at Asa Winstanley on Twitter. Um, I most frequently publish at the Electronic Intifada. Um, and other places uh, after that. So, yeah, com to keep on touch with all my work. Thank you very much for joining us, Asa. Um, and thank you for joining us today and watching the show. Until next time, this is Low Key. See you on the Watchdog here at Mint Press. Thank you. Oh.